Um, so today is our first um, series presentation for Clinical Trials Toolkit. I'm going to be talking about data integrity, HIPAA, and confidentiality. Um, throughout, throughout the presentation, I'm going to launch some poll questions and do a little, um, just a little bit more interaction. Um, so please feel free to interact with me. Um, if you do have questions, please feel free to um, place those in the chat. Um, Lisa, who is our co-host today, she's actually facilitating that. Um, and we will definitely um, look at any questions. Um, or if you want to take yourself off the mute, feel free to ask questions that way as well. So for those of you that may not know who I am, my name is Debbie Lee. I'm the training coordinator for CTSI Clinical Trial Center of Excellence. Um, I've actually been at WVU now for about a year and a half. Um, previous to that, I was at 17 years um, at a clinical research organization. So I've really lived um, the life of clinical trials. Um, and I was thinking about today, I, I felt bad because anytime I ask somebody to present for me, I ask for them to share um, something interesting that people may not know about them. So I guess I will also do that as well. Um, for those of you that may know, um, I think I've seen a couple people on the call that probably know this. Um, my degree is actually in geology. Um, so I am a rock lover. Um, on top of that, I actually worked at Laurel Caverns one summer um, for an internship. So there's my, my fun fact that you may not have known. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, our objectives today is to obtain an understanding of what is research misconduct and how to prevent it, right? We don't want that research misconduct for our clinical trials here at WVU. We also want to be able to identify gaps in data integrity. Um, I am going to define the HIPAA rules, um, understand how it applies to protecting the subject's protected health information as well. Um, and some of this may be, um, you know, a refresher to you. I know that we do have to retake our HIPAA training um, through WVU, but I think this is, is a different way to approach it because we actually can talk about it um, versus maybe just doing our, you know, yearly um, module that we do. So let's talk about good research practices. So I have my coworkers there. Um, they're holding up research misconduct, data integrity, and HIPAA. And I purposely picked puzzle pieces because they all fit together, right? Um, integrity can include you know, research work, um, but it's not limited to the design of the study, experiments, generating, rec recording, analyze and interpreting, sharing that data, um, presenting and publishing, training new researcher staff um, and students, peer review, um, the work of other researchers. Um, so research res results need to be checked for accuracy and consistency by the researchers responsible for them before they make them public. Researchers must be able to explain and justify how results were reached. Um, all research data must be managed and curated effectively throughout its life cycle to ensure integrity, security, and quality. Where possible to support new research and research, research data sharing. Um, so it's really our principles that we're starting off with today. So let's go ahead and start with data integrity. Um, there is a security rule, and I do have the reference there for you. It's 45 CRF part 160, parts A and C, also part of 164. So the security rule, um, rules, excuse me, identify how we must protect the information. The security applies to physical, technical, and administrative safeguards, and we're actually going to walk through each of those, that are put in place to protect the integrity, availability, and confidentiality of information. Is the systems established to protect electronic PHI during transmission and storage? So let's first, we, I told you we're going to look, look at all three of those. So let's first look at administrative safeguards. So rules for creating and changing passwords, right? So for example, um, I know with our um, passwords, you know, we can't use part of our name, right? And that makes sense because it would be easy to guess that um, if somebody was trying to hack into the system. Um, also, also with administrative safeguards is unauthorized software is forbidden. 
I don't know if you've ever tried to download something and it gets blocked um, and you have to, if you feel that you need that, you have to go through, for me, I go through HSCIT. So making sure that it's actually authorized software. And sometimes I'm told no, I'll be honest. So um, with administrative safeguards, we also wanna make sure there's backup, um, there's electronic audit, and you also wanna make sure there's a recovery system. All of that needs to be in place. Let's talk about physical safeguards, right? We have screen savers. We have automatic workstation timeouts, right? In case when, when you do walk away from your workstation, you should be locking it, right? We wanna make sure I shouldn't be able to walk up um, to somebody else's um, computer and you know, let's say Encore is open and I can actually see a patient name. So we do have automatic workstation timeouts, but you should also be locking your computer when you walk away as well. We also have virus protection, you know, once again, putting that physical safeguard in place. Um, there's also rules for electronic storage of files containing PHI, including laptop computers and other mobile devices. And you never want to store PHI on personally owned devices. So making sure that PHI is not on your personal devices. Also PHI on portable devices, um, and this is actually taken from the regulation, CD-ROMs, DVDs, flash drives, thumb drives, must be encrypted in accordance with HSC IT security policy. Um, because what would happen if, you know, that thumb drive, I put, I, I'll, excuse me, I'll be honest, I typically put it in my pocket. Um, I usually put presentations on it. Um, but what if I had PHI on it? I placed it in my pocket. Um, it actually came out of my pocket as I was walking down the halls of health sciences. So making sure that that's also encrypted. Um, I know, uh, you know, they're also in making sure your laptops are also encrypted as well. So technical safeguards. Systems are in place to validate identity, right? Control access, ensure data integrity, provide for safe data storage, and monitor and track what is done within the electronic architecture, right? So what you don't want to happen is if I place a note in a patient's chart um, or let's say an Encore, what we don't want to happen is for someone else to be able to go in and actually remove it with no information behind saying what happened to it. Um, so making sure that that monitor and tracking is within that electronic architecture. Um, the system also should be designed to assist with reporting of violations and compliant investigations. And we're actually going to look at a case um, where some people at a um, hospital actually looked in a patient's chart um, and they had no business being in that patient's chart, right? So making sure um, that those are also in place in your system as well. So let's talk about misconduct. So this is actually from the Office of Research Integrity. Research misconduct means fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism in proposing, performing, or reviewing research and reporting research results. Um, it doesn't include honest error or differences of opinion. So just that clarification was placed there. So there's my misconduct. So let's actually talk a little bit more about what each of those are. Fabrication is making up data or results and recording or reporting them. Falsification, I'm going to, you know, I can manipulate research materials, equipment or processes, or change or omit data. You know, so if I'm looking at, um, a, if I'm collecting labs for a patient, um, and these labs are way outside the range, um, and maybe I decide not to include those when I do my analysis, right? So that would be falsification. Um, plagiarism is, or sorry, plagiarism, is the um, appropriation of another person's ideas, um, process, results, or words without giving um, appropriate credit. So here's some misconduct case summaries. Um, so we had a researcher at University of Texas, um, Dr. Anderson at the Cancer Center. Um, he or she intentionally and knowingly um, falsified and or fabricated data 
recorded dates and provided her own blood samples for 98 study subjects. Um, so once again, you know, falsifying that information or fa fabricating or falsifying. Um, we had a researcher at Wayne State University. Um, they were actually debarred from contracting or subcontracting with the U.S. government for a period of five years. They recklessly caused or, per or permitted 23 instances of research misconduct in three grant applications, two articles, and two posters. So once again, we want to make sure that we don't have this misconduct at WVU or any of our partner sites as well. Um, preventing data integrity issues. So how do we make sure we, we don't have those data integrity issues? First thing is we wanna make sure everything is 21 CFR part 11 compliant. I know, you know, anytime we're talking about, you know, looking at a new system to potentially purchase, or um, yesterday we actually had a conversation about Adobe um, electronic signature, you know, is that 21 CFR part 11 compliant? Um, so making sure those are conversations that you're having. Um, validate your computer system. You know, it might take a while, it probably will take a while to validate it. Um, but once again, you have that paperwork. If an auditor would step in, you, you can show that that computer system was validated. Because um, that validation is going to give that level of confidence, the device meets all the requirements and user expectations for the software. We also want to implement audit trails, right? We want to make sure that things are time stamped electronic. Um, we want to make sure if I modify something, it captures what I modified, who the user was, and at what time it was modified. Um, you want to secure your records with limited system access. So for example, if you have a storage room where you're maybe storing um, studies that have already closed, um, is that room locked? Um, is it restricted access to that room? Um, properly trained personnel and maintain training records. Um, so for example, I do a lot of training, as most of you know, it's kind of my title, so I'm kind of, you know, kind of part of what I do. Um, so making sure people are properly trained um, and also maintaining those training records as well. When I do training, I usually, like you guys today, I will provide you back with a training sign-in sheet, which you're not signing, but I confirm, um, I write a note at the bottom to say you attended training today. Um, so making sure that's done. Conduct internal audits to evaluate controls and procedures. And I'm gonna tell you, I would rather much have Tanya and part of her team or Yvonne at the Cancer Center to come in and do an internal audit on a um, clinical trial to help me look, you know, look at these controls, look at these procedures and say, well, we need to write an SOP around this. Great, because you know what? I would rather um, have an internal audit that way when the FDA potentially walks through the doors, I know I already have you know, information that they might wanna look at. Um, you wanna do a data risk assessment. So you wanna perform a data integrity risk assessment. Um, processes that produce data or where data is obtained or mapped out. Um, each of the formats and their controls are identified, inherent risk are documented. Um, is data saved contemporaneously, meaning it's recorded in real time? How is the data reviewed? Um, you know, part of what we do at CTSI, we have an eligibility sheet where we look at two, um, we actually have two different people review that data. Is an audit trail or activity log implemented? Do the contents of the audit trail follow alcoic? You know, is it attributable? legible, contemporaneous, original, accurate, and complete. Are electronic records restricted from modification after e-signature? Um, so let's say you have a 1572 um, and you're sending it out for an e-signature. We wanna make sure that that can't be changed after that signature has been applied because um, we don't want maybe the facility address to be changed um, after it's been signed. If it does need to be, we can definitely change it, but we have to get a new signature. Can audit trails be enabled or disabled or deleted by the routine users? You know, we have 
and I know at least Encore, we have a, a, a wide range of different user types to make sure that, you know, there is an admin person that has those overarching rights, but they're very limited, right, to that one or two people, um, whereas me as a trainer, I don't have access to do that. Are date and time stamps or settings protected? So one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to close the gaps, right? Some gaps can be closed quickly. So let's say we find gaps. Um, you know, sometimes this is a procedural control. I talked about maybe we need to write an SOP um, or we need to modify an SOP. Um, but at that time, we want to make sure we train the staff. Um, depending on what it is, we might want to have refresher training as well. Um, it updates to configuration, you know, maybe you need to work with your IT department um, and, and do some updates. Others might require some more time, you know, it might require new equipment. Um, maybe you don't have something that's 21 CFR compliant for e-signatures um, and you may need to get some new software. Um, procedure controls with audit oversight. So sometimes you're going to close those gaps. There's ones that you can do quickly. There's other ones that might require some more of your time. All right, let's talk about confidentiality. What records must be kept confidential? Um, for 40, 45 CRF 46 provides protection um, and it's for confidentiality of research participants as follows. So part A is the protection of human research participants. Um, I'm sorry, I should say subpart B is additional protection and this is for pregnant women, fetuses or neonates. Subpart C, um, is for prisoners involved in biomedic, biomedical and behavioral research. Part D is for the protection of children. Um, for 45 CRF 46, HIPAA mandates privacy protections for individuals' identifiable health information. Um, and I have the CRF um, um, address there for you as well. The HIPAA security rule establishes standards to protect individuals' electronic personal health information. Um, there are some exceptions um, to, that, to that confidentiality. Um, so that's why I have my goldfish there. Um, there's, those are my confidentiality. Um, but there are exceptions. That's why I have my beta, because he's completely different um, than my goldfish. Federal regulations identify certain exceptions to the confidentiality requirements for alcohol and drug abuse participant records. Um, some other examples of exceptions are need to know, criminal activity, suspected child abuse or neglect, danger to self, medical emergencies, or research activities. Um, there is also, you can get a certificate of confidentiality. Um, your acronym is COC. And that protects the privacy of the research subjects by prohibiting disclosure of identifiable, sensitive research information to anyone not connected to the research except when the subject consents or in a few other specific um, situations. So if you do have something that's NIH funded um, and you're using identifiable, sensitive information, COCs are actually automatically issued. Um, certificates for health-related research that's not federally funded, can also, you can also request a COC. Um, disclosure of information, it's, um, so it's disclosure of information, physical documents, or biased specimens protected by a certificate permitted only when they're required by other federal, state, or local laws, such as for reporting of communicable diseases, and made with consent of the subject or made for the purposes of scientific research that's compliant with human subjects regulations. So covered entities are identifiable sensitive information that includes, but it's not limited to, name, address, social security, or other identifiable um, numbers, fingerprints, voice prints, photographs, genetic information, tissue samples, or data fields that when used in combination with other information may lead to identification of an individual. So let's talk about HIPAA. So I have my HIPAA basics there. So let me just stop sharing for one second. I'm gonna actually launch a poll here. So you should now be able to see on your screen, I have a poll launch. So what does HIPAA stand for? If you notice, I haven't written it out yet in the slides.
give you a couple seconds. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. It seems like we've had a, several people participate. All right, let me share those results. So 82% did Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. So let me go back to my slides here. So HIPAA actually stands for, oh, sorry. Let me go, let me get to here. Health In Insurance Portability Accountability Act. So I kind of tricked you. I did the information the first one. So it actually is health insurance. And I think most times we see HIPAA and we all know what that's about. And let me just go back to my first slide here. So when HIPAA first came out, it was really, um, there was a lot of joke about HIPPO versus HIPAA. Um, so I really um, took some time to research and we're going to look at how a HIPPO um, is very like HIPAA. So regarding privacy, hippos are very private animals. Um, if you've ever went to a wetlands or any place you've went to the zoo where the hippos are, they definitely do not want, them, want you coming in with them. They will definitely protect their territory. HIPAA does the same thing. It wants to help to ensure privacy. There's also strength. Um, we know, um, you're probably all picturing in your mind as I am, those hippos with their jaws open. Um, they have really strong jaws and those large teeth for protection. HIPAA, with HIPAA, researchers and institutions can be bitten for strong fines and penalties. We're actually gonna look at a couple, a couple cases um, if you don't comply with protecting patients. Um, so as we know, because we you know, have to redo our um, research, um, it's a federal law enacted in 1996. Um, the law required the Department of Health and Human Resources to provide rules and regulations setting national standards for privacy, security, and electronic transfer of personal health information. Um, for today's training, we're going to actually focus on Title II of HIPAA. Um, so one of the rules is a security rule. It requires covered entities to maintain reasonable and appropriate administrative, technical, and physical safeguards protecting electronic protected health information. We typically see that as EPHI. Um, so these are the rules under HIPAA. There's privacy, security, breach notification, and omnibus rule. So let's first talk about privacy rule. So the privacy rule applies to protected health information in all forms. Um, so those forms can be that I have two people there, they're actually having a conversation. So it definitely protects them. So think about when you are having conversations, it's probably not the best thing to be talking with your participant in the waiting room um, about the clinical trial, making sure that they're you know, in a room um, with no other patients around. It also protects written. Um, so at no time should I be able to walk up to someone's desk and there's um, you know, informed consent uh, that's open and I can see the patient's name and what study they're on. It also protects electronic. And we've talked a lot about electronic records as well. Um, so making sure that those are protected as well. Whether they're in the application or they're being transferred as well, um, either to a thumb drive or they're being transferred other ways. Um, PHI disclosure standards. And there are penalties for improper disclosure and misuse um, uh, under the privacy rule. Um, it could be everything from you have to pay a fine to actual jail time. So also security rule, which we've talked a little bit at the very beginning. Monitor access to PHI, lay out specific requirements concerning contracts between covered entities and business associates. So also policies and procedures to ensure the health organization's compliance with HIPAA as well. So what is considered protected health information under HIPAA? Health information created or received by a covered entity that identifies the individual or to which there is a reasonable basis to believe the information can be used to identify the individual. 
Um, so for example, one, I, one thought is, you know, if I just put the patient's year, um, you know, on my spreadsheet is 89, um, but that could still be linked back to the patient because of how old they are. Um, so kind of thinking about that. We're going we're gonna to talk about the identifiers here in a, a couple minutes. Um, so um, what are the patient's name, their address, um, their birth date, their social security number, an individual's physical or mental health condition, any care provided to an individual, information concerning the payment for the care provided to the individual that identifies the patient or information for which there is a reasonable basis to believe it could be used to identify the patient. Um, so, you know, if you have your list of patients and, and maybe you don't, you're really great, you don't have their names or anything, but you have their um, Blue Cross Blue Shield number, once again, that could be linked back to that patient. So what's, what's considered covered entities? Um, it's a healthcare provider that conducts certain standard administrative and financial transactions in electronic form. A healthcare clearinghouse, um, and it's also referred to as medical claims clearinghouse. So it's anyone acting as a third party intermittent between the providers of healthcare and those who pay um, for the healthcare and a health plan. Um, let's talk about the breach notification role. Process the HIPAA entities must follow in the event of a breach. So depending on the number of individuals affected by a given breach, there are different timelines and notification standards. Um, made business associates of covered entities directly reliable for compliance with certain HIPAA privacy and security rules. And there's even stricter rules for the execution of business associate agreements. So let's look at, let me stop sharing here for a second. Let's look at another poll question. And this one is, I would, I would like for you to indicate all that are examples of protected health information. So Sally fell and split open her lip. The next one is a date of birth. I have the actual date of birth there. I have notes about when her surgery occurred. I have a year of birth of 1980. I have the gender, the disease state. The fourth one there is a date of birth, um, protocol name, safety. Um, and the last one there is Fred Flintstone was previously discharged on 8-5 in 2019. And you can pick multiple answers. So please click all that are examples of protected health information. Okay, give you a couple more minutes to do that. Debbie, they're saying it would only let them pick one. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Okay, thank you guys for letting me know that. Well, I messed that one up, didn't I? See, technology works great when you set it up correctly. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll. <laughs> sorry about that. Let me um, share the results here. So I apologize since you couldn't pick the ones. Um, so Sally, right, we included the patient's name, right? That's protected health information. Um, same thing with the next one, we have her date of birth there. Now the next one, we have her um, year of birth. Um, we do have her gender, and then we also have her, her um, medical information there as well. Um, next one, we also have the date of birth. Um, we have the protocol name, and I can see that that patient is HIV. Um, and looking for HIV vaccine, excuse me. And last one, I have the patient name. So those are actually all examples of patients with PHI. Okay, thanks for letting me know that, everyone. I apologize about that. Okay, let me grab my slides back here. Okay, 
So let's talk about engineering. So going back to my hippo versus HIPAA. So for engineering, hippos are accomplished engineers. I don't know if you knew that today before you came here to this training. Did you know you're going to learn about hippos? Probably not. Um, so hippos are accomplished engineers because they can actually create and change the land around their wetlands. Um, they do that by moving lots of soil and it, by their, just their sheer size. Um, HIPAA also requires system and policy engineering as well. Um, so some methods, we, so we talked about, we want to make sure if we are, you know, if we do need to de-identify de information. Um, with the HIPAA, there's two identification methods. Um, there's the expert determination, and I have the um, CRF um, information there, so if you want to read more information, you definitely can. Um, I'll provide these slides after training today. I'll provide the slides and the sign-in sheets for anybody. I know some of you, um, for example, are ACRP or SOCRA, so I will provide that information so you can submit that to those organizations. Um, so we're going to look at Safe Harbor, um, and that's the one we're going to actually um, look at today is a Safe Harbor one. So that's the removal of 18 types of identifiers. Um, no acceptable knowledge, residual information can identify the individual. So let's look at all the different um, Safe Harbor identifiers. So I have my, my band there behind there with the patient um, information that has lots of patient information on it, right? Um, so, to de-identify all elements of dates except the year related to an individual must be removed to, in order to de-identify. And that's dates of discharge, admission, you know, we, of course we know, um, uh, you know, birth date. Um, any elements of the date, um, they're indicative of their age. A medical record number, because I could definitely use that to link that back to that patient. Of course, their names, or their names, excuse me. Any device identifiers and serial numbers. Health plan beneficiary numbers, I think I talked about that one earlier. Their email address, um, for example, my email address, uh, my personal email address has my name in it. Um, telephone numbers, account numbers, social security numbers. All geographic subdivisions smaller than a state, except for the initial three digits of the zip code. Um, IP addresses, I, I don't know who takes IP addresses, but I don't even know mine, so just, just being transparent. Um, full face photos and comparable images. Biometrical identifiers, um, and that's including finger and voice prints. Any unique identifying number, characteristic, or code, except as permitted. Um, certificate, license numbers, vehicle identifiers and serial numbers, including license plate numbers, and any fax numbers. I don't even know who has fax numbers regarding a patient, but making sure if that is on there, if you need to de-identify that, that would need to be removed as well. Um, also, website URLs as well. So, how do you re-identify? How do you do re-identification? A covered a covered entity may assign a code or other means or record identification to allow information um, de-identified. Um, so, you could have um, derivation is the code or other means of record identification. It's not derived from or related to information about the individual, and it's not otherwise capable of being translated to as to identify the individual. Um, for example, I was in a clinical trial um, at a different um, facility, um, and my identification code was actually my initials and my year of birth. So that's not really a de-identified number, a signed code, um, because it could still be linked back to me. Um, security, the covered entity does not use or disclose the code or other means of record identification for any other purposes and does not disclose the mechanism for re-identification. So let's talk about protecting PHI, right? Going back to my HIPPO versus HIPAA. Um, collective security, 
Um, HIPAAs work to ensure a collective security. Once again, I talked about their wetlands. They want to make sure nothing else comes into their territory. HIPAA does the same. It requires that security measures are implemented to safeguard a member's collective records. Um, so ways to safeguard PHI. Um, be discreet in your communications involving PHI. Can anybody else overhear your conversation? Um, you know, patient information may not be discussed with their family, friends, or coworkers who do not need to know or if they don't have permission to know. Um, you know, I've been on a clinical trial where um, they actually brought, you know, if they have a family member with them, um, they actually brought the subject back first, asked them if it was okay for that family member to join them, and then they got them out of the waiting room. So making sure that we're discreet around that. Um, log off your computer when, when you're leaving the room or your workstation. Do not leave any patient documents in open areas and properly dispose of PHI. So if you do have, um, in maybe um, you printed out the informed consent, um, you know, it's not the original form consent, maybe it's a copy of it, um, and you don't, you no longer need it, um, making sure, because it does have that patient's name on it, that it is placed in a shred bin. Use caution to get the patient's permission prior to discussing PHI in front of others. Sorry, I kind of jumped ahead there. Um, contain your curiosity, right? Um, view only patient information you need to do your job. Ask yourself, do I need to know, is this my role to look up my sister's WVU account? Probably not. Not probably, it is not, okay? Um, snooping in a patient's medical record can result in termination from your job with additional consequences as well. Um, know your role as it relates to viewing records. Um, WVU employees are not permitted to access their own. So even though I'm a WVU employee, I cannot go into Epic and look up my own chart. Um, I can't look up friends, family members, medical information. If I need to look up my medical information, I need to go through my WVU chart. Keep passwords private, right? So my person there is asking, can you keep a secret? right? Don't share your password. Because one of the things we talked about already, we talked about different people have different access, right? Um, if I happen to have the username and password for our administrator, I have way more rights than I should have, right? The other thing, if you're using someone else's username and password, remember we talked about that audit trail behind the scenes? That's now capturing that that person was in the system and what they did and that's not true because you're using their username and password. So if you need access to something, make sure you talk to your principal investigator, make sure you actually get, the, get your own username and password. Only work, oh, see I jumped ahead again, I'm sorry. Only work under your assigned password. Um, do not use the same password at work as you use at home. Um, you know, a great example of this, I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but um, LinkedIn, which is currently hacked several months ago, um, I got an email and it said, um, hi, it had my password um, that I had used for LinkedIn like 10 years ago. It was, it, they got old information, but still, if I had used that password for every account, how much easier is that for a hacker to get into different accounts? So making sure you don't use that same one. Um, disclosure of information. When a telephone call is received and the caller requests information, confirm the identity of the caller prior to answering questions, right? So we don't want to just, you know, start giving out information. When leaving a message for a patient, do not disclose PHI. Simply leave the information for a return communication. Don't email, um, do not use email to communicate with patients. Um, there is a way at WVU to send secure emails, so if it is needed, um, what you would do is put in those brackets secure in all caps in the subject line. It will secure it before it leaves your email or your sent box, and it will arrive in the inbox secure as well. Um, so let's talk about breach. What is a breach? The acquisition access use or disclosure of PHI in a manner not permitted under the privacy rule, which comprises the security of privacy of the PHI. 
any unintentional acquisition or use of PHI by a workforce member or person acting under the authority of a covered entity or a business associate. Any inadvert disclosure by a person who is authorized to access PHI as a CE or BA to another person authorized to access PHI at the same CE or BA and the information is not further used or disclosed. Um, or a disclosure PHI where a covered entity or business associate has a good faith belief that an unauthorized person to whom the disclosure was made would not reasonably have been made or able to retain such information. Once again, I have um, my reference there for you. Um, if there is a breach, investigators must promptly report a breach of confidentiality to the WV IRB if they occur under the auspicious of WVU research and making sure that you know that. So there could be civil or criminal penalties. Um, the Office of Civil Rights is able to impose civil penalties for organizations that fail to comply with HIPAA rules. Um, there's also the U.S. Department of Justice investigates and prosecutes criminal violations of HIPAA. So can you get a fine or more for snooping? So let's talk about in 2008, um, Britney Spears was admitted to UCLA Medical Center. Six doctors and 13 employees of UCLA viewed her records without a legit medical reason. Um, out of those 13 employees, many of the employees were even non-medical support staff. So they were just snooping in her chart, right? So making sure um, that we don't have that done here at WVU. Um, there are penalty amounts. So this is for the Office of Civil Rights. Um, they can impose pen penalties on a covered entity for a failure to comply. Um, so I have the penalty amount. So let's just say we're after, two th or after February 18th of 2009, let's say something happened today. Um, our penalty could be $100 to $50,000 or more per violation. Um, they do cap it at $1.5 million for the year. Um, but, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm sure your departments probably don't have, you know, extra money sitting around for violations or penalties. So we want to try you know, at all costs, not, not to do that. Okay. Um, this is from the Office of Civil Rights. This is from 2018. It's just a list. Um, it gives a date and also um, the name um, that um, got a penalty. So I did want to talk a little bit further about this one here in the middle with um, Dr. Anderson. Um, they were with the University of Texas. Um, they had three separate breaches. They actually had theft of an unencrypted laptop from the residence of an employee. They had loss of two unencrypted thumb drives. There was 30, 33,500 individual information on that thumb drive. Um, after um, part of what he or Dr. Anderson had to do, and I apologize, I don't know if it's a he or she, um, they had to write encryption policies, um, high risk findings, um, so making sure that you know, because there was a breach, going back and making sure that didn't happen again. Um, if you notice, Dr. Anderson was, um, his amount was, or his or her amount was four, 4 million 348. So once again, we don't want that happening here. Oh, thank you, Rishi. Um, she, our Dr. Or, Dr. Bhandari, sorry. Um, MD Anderson is actually a hospital center in Texas. I apologize, I did not know that. Thank you for that. So you guys have all kind of knowledge, I love it. Okay, so let's do some case studies. Um, and I'm praying that all my poll questions I set up correctly. So please bear with me if they don't and please let me know, I greatly appreciate it. So my first case study here is, I just got a call, so this is a physician talking to maybe his office manager. I just got a call from another physician who, has a, who, has, excuse me, who is at a local medical conference, and he wants me to email Mr. Lee's lab results to his personal email account. He plans to assess the results from the hotel's business center computer. He's leaving the conference now to meet the patient at the emergency room. What should I do? Let me stop sharing here for a second. Okay. 
Okay, so for this one, we're just going to do the very first one and then we'll, we'll I'll relaunch it. So what should the physician do? Email the record right away. He's a trusted colleague. Answer number two, determine if he has access to encrypted email and if not, securely fax results immediately to the hospital. Number three is knowing that he has a password on his personal email account. Agree to send the lab results. It will be safe enough and you know him. Number four, don't tell anyone, but go ahead and send the results away in this case. Chances are slim anything will happen. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to answer. Okay, Sherry let me know she can't submit unless they answer both questions. Okay, I see someone answer this one below, okay. Okay, let me end the poll then, and then we'll talk about them. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm, just, I'm not gonna scroll down, we're just gonna look at the first one. So what should the physician do? Um, email the record right away, he's a trusted colleague. So that's sometimes how security breaches can happen um, because it's between friends, right? And you know that person. You know, he's a trusted colleague, but still that is a breach. So making sure um, that we don't just email, email right away. Um, number two is actually the best option because determine if he has access to encrypted email. And if not, we can fax the results over to the hospital, right? Um, just because he has a password on his personal email does not mean it's secure, it's encrypted. Um, don't tell anyone, but go ahead and send the results. Chances are slim, anything will happen. But what if, you know, it's not a, well, it, it, you know, this is the only time I've ever done it. No, we should not do it. We need to follow um, the guidance. All right, so let's look at the next one. All right, the next one is in my office manager there. We just discovered that one of her nurses had been viewing her estranged mother-in-law's electronic health records and was sharing the information with her friends. Um, even if you don't like your mother-in-law, we shouldn't be doing that. This is a violation of the confidentiality agreement that she signs annually, and she will be terminated today. What should my next step or steps be? So this one, I'm gonna launch the poll, but this time I'm going to ask if you don't mind um, coming off a of mute, maybe we can just discuss it. I'm just gonna relaunch it here. So this is the, the question number two. What are the next steps? Speak to the nurse and fire her immediately, regardless of patients or other staff in the vicinity. Call the nurse into your office prior to lunch and advise her that her employment is ceasing. Make a note to notify IT by the end of the week. Contact the person with administrative privileges to deactivate all of her user accounts. Then notify the nurse in private of her immediate termination. Tell the billing manager to notify the nurse that she's been fired. Then leave for a long lunch because you like to avoid conflict wherever possible. So have any, anyone have any thoughts on this one? I was gonna say, and if you, I see one person has already answered. If you just wanna pick the answer above and then pick the right answer for step number two, that will, and then you can hit submit, that totally works. Okay, getting lots of answers on, great, thank you. Thank you for working around my user error, I appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to end the poll there and I'm going to share the results. And we're going to just look at the second one. So what are the next steps? Um, so everyone said, con or people that voted said contact the person with administrative privilege to de deactivate all of her user accounts. Absolutely. 
because what we want to do is we want to make sure we deactivate her accounts um, so she doesn't have access after she's been told she's terminated. Um, and then notify the nurse in private of her immediate termination, right? We don't want to embarrass her. And that's what number one's going to do, um, speak to a nurse and fire her immediately, regardless of anybody that's around. That's, you know, we, we don't want to do that. And that one didn't say anything about deactivating her accounts either, so. Um, the second one is call the nurse into your office prior to lunch. Um, and then notify IT, you know, I'll just put it on my to-do list. I'll get to it by the end of the week. Once again, if it's an application that can be accessed outside the hospital or outside health sciences, she could easily go home and log in and, you know, remove stuff, you know, make changes, things like that. Um, this, the last one, just tell the billing manager to notify the nurse she's been fired. So you're basically passing the buck. Um, and then you're taking a long lunch because you don't like to, um, you don't like conflicts. We don't want to do that one either. So um, thank you guys so much for doing those with me. Um, just looking at time here, when you look at our next one, and it doesn't have a polling question, so we should be good. All right, so this one is Dr. Talman at Mountaineer Surgical Associates Incorporated referred a patient to Dr. Riley since she is conducting research on mouth cancer. Dr. Talman passed along the patient's information and cell phone number. The physician told the nurse it was fine to send the information since the patient had signed the privacy rule. Um, so this one was actually, um, this actually came from the Office of Civil Rights. Um, so what are some things that you think may have happened um, that the Office of Civil Rights may have found wrong with this case? Uh, so if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to take yourself off of mute and talk to me. Or if you want to put something in the chat, that's totally fine as well. Okay, um, so I don't see anything coming in through chat. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, talk about what the Office of Civil Rights found. Um, they provided technical assistance to the covered entity regarding the requirement that covered entities seeking to disclose PHI for research recruitment purposes must obtain a valid patient authorization or an institutional review board or privacy board approved alteration to a to or a waiver of authorization. So in this case, they did not get that um, and they passed that patient's name and cell phone over. Um, the other thing is um, they required for this office. Um, so, you know, we talked about closing those gaps. So there was a gap that was identified. Um, unfortunately, it was identified by the Office of Civil Rights. Um, but they did have to then rewrite um, their, policy, their policies and procedures regarding disclosure of PHI for research um, to require valid written authorizations. Um, they had to retrain their entire staff on the new policies and procedures. They had to log the disclosure of the patient's PHI for accounting purposes and send the patient a letter apologizing for the impermissible disclosure. Um, so a lot of steps that they had to do there um, because they passed it along um, without obtaining that patient's um, uh, actually on an authorization form. All right, I'm looking at time here. Um, are, are there any questions? Okay, so somebody asked, what is our local policy for initials? Um, policy for initials. Oh, are you talking about like like de-identifying information? If they, if it just has the initials there, is it considered de-identified? And if you'd like, you can. If you have a mic, you're welcome to take yourself off mute to talk to us. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, let me look here. Uh, 
I saw a couple people on the phone. Um, uh, does Tanya, I saw, I think Sarah also joined us as well. Do either one of you know the policy for initials? What is our local policy? I'm not sure, Debbie, hi, this is Tanya. I'm not sure what the question is, if we're allowed to use initials as a code identifier for participants in research. Is that the question? Let me see if she if she types something else back into the chat. She doesn't have a mic. Oh, she put subject IP. Yeah, so I don't think we have a written policy on that, but I do see that as current practice. That there can be an initial um, identifier. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to phone a friend there, Tanya. No worries. Okay. All right, anybody else have any questions or any comments? All right, well, thank you all so much for taking your time today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for working through me with my little hiccups. Um, if you haven't already, please um, put your name in the chat for attendance. Um, once again, CEs are offered. Just put CE with your email address. Um, and then I will follow up on Monday um, with the slides and also the sign-in sheet. Um, so you'll have that for your records. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, our next presentation will be on Friday, October 9th. Um, Ann Schnatterly is going to be talking to us about how to use Encore for our research. Um, so if you'd like to join that, please feel free to email me and I can get you the invite. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Have a great day.